mass extinction. According to scientists, there have been five such events in Earth's history. And while billions of dollars in research has cascaded through the fingers of our planet's sharpest intellects in an attempt to piece together the exact origins of each event, the end result is always the same. An immediate, swift eradication of life on Earth. Each extinction event is its own unique symphony of destruction. Unleashed in such a rapid and unforgiving manner, the Earth itself mourns the loss of life that once thrived upon its surface. Yet from the ashes of each extinction, a new species always emerges. Stronger than ever before, they become the dominant power, exuding their authority and their rule over the world, until nature decides it's time to reshuffle the deck. In the 1970s, motocross was ruled by European men on European motorcycles. It was their sport, their creation, their rule. But from the east, a change was coming, one that would strike with the swiftness of a katana-wielding samurai, a sharp, clean cut sent across the motorsports world that would be so deep it would lead to the immediate, swift eradication of European motorcycles, casting them into a fiery lake of financial purgatory that would take Europe more than 30 years to recover from. It would be the Honda Elsinore. A bike so revolutionary that it would steal the sport of motocross right out from underneath of the European manufacturers that created it. It was the motorcycle that put Japan on the map as a racing powerhouse in American motocross, elevating the sport to a whole new level and launching an era of dominance that is still going on to this very day. But as game-changing as the Elsinore was, it was a motorcycle that the owner of Honda swore they would never build, and one that took the finagling of a few young engineers operating in secret to convince him otherwise. Yet in less than two short years, Honda would go from two-stroke haters to two-stroke innovators. So in today's video, we'll explore the unique history of the Honda Elsinore, and why this was the most pivotal motocross bike that has ever been built. Honda. It's a name synonymous with a whole bunch of motocross titles that were obtained by a whole bunch of motocross goats like Bailey, Smith, Johnson, Hannah, Lachine, Stanton, Bale, The Osho, Magoo, McGrath, Tomac, The Lawrences, and of course, the goat of all goats, Carmichael. And that's to name a few. There's way more than that. And the roots of all that success could be traced back to the Honda Elsinore 125 and 250 cc models. In the mid to late 1960s, motocross is an unknown sport in the United States. But even though there isn't any motocross, Americans are off-roading in the form of hair scramblers and trail riding. But at that time, the sport is all about the Europeans. That was until a man by the name of Edison Dye, who is now known as the father of American motocross, would introduce this sport to the United States. Now, Edison Dye was an entrepreneur, opportunist, and visionary. And he has quite the story himself that reads like a stroke of serendipity worthy enough to be placed in this story. As legend has it, a man by the name of Stig Eriksson, who was the Swedish importer for Husqvarna motorcycles, was vacationing in El Cajon, California, when he meets Edison Dye. The two would start talking about European motocross, and in short, Edison says, if you allow me to be the importer of Husqvarna motorcycles in America, I will build the sport of motocross here. So in 1966, he brings over one of Europe's top riders to race against the Americans. And the rider he would bring would be reigning world motocross champion Torsten Hullman. Now, your younger generation out there might recognize that name via the ultra popular gear company, Torsten Hallman Off-Road, better known as Thor. Now, obviously, Hallman being a seasoned motocrosser had no problems waxing the floor with the much less talented Americans, especially since the track was designed by him and Edison Dye. 
Needless to say, it works. Motocross starts to become wildly popular in the United States. But there's a problem with this. The only proper out-of-the-box motocross bikes are being made by European manufacturers like CZ, BSA, Bultaco, and Husqvarna. And they are unreliable, expensive to fix, and almost impossible to obtain parts for. This led many riders to buy Japanese bikes or docile trail bikes, then take a hacksaw and welder to them, throw on a set of knobbies, and go racing. They did this because they were cheaper, more reliable, and readily available to the public. But it took an enormous amount of work to make these motorcycles race ready. And even with that, they still were not as competitive as the European motorcycles. And this brings us to Honda. Honda, with the success of motorcycles like the CB750, 350, and the wildly popular Super Cub scooter, was already a large, successful motorcycle company. And they did have a few off-road models like the ST90 and CT90, which they still make today in the form of the Trail 125 and the Honda Monkey. And later they would add an SL70, 125, and 350, but these were trail bikes, not motocrossers. In fact, the SLs were so slow and lame, magazines would use words and phrases like turtle, innocent, and tree sap to define it. And I tell you what, I can vouch for that because the irony here is I owned a Honda SL70 at one time. It was a hand-me-down from my grandpa and he gave it to me basically because the bike was too slow to carry his weight. And he was only like 190 pounds. And my brother and I used to call it the sorry loser. That's what we thought the SL should stand for. And this is where Honda finds themselves in a catch-22 that would ultimately become a defining moment in their history. One of the reasons that the European bikes were so much more powerful and lighter was because they used two-stroke engines. And the two-stroke engines at that time simply destroyed the heavier and slower four-stroke motorcycles. Now, as most of you know by now, because it's been well documented since the inception of the Elsinore, that the founder of Honda, Soichiro Honda, did not like two-stroke motorcycles. He thought they were dirty and noisy. And he was famously quoted as saying that Honda would never build a two-stroke engine. And one of the reasons for that is Soichiro felt that the simplicity of a two-stroke engine was too easy for the average garage wannabe mechanic to work on. And he was right about that. But what bothered him the most is he didn't want the average mechanic trying to work on his engine because they might screw it up and that would reflect badly on his company. And that was one of the reasons that he refused to build two strokes. But at this point in time, motocross is growing rapidly in the United States and Honda wants in big time. And they're starting to lose significant ground to their competitors. So they approach American riders Gary Jones, who is the newly crowned and the very first 250cc AMA motocross champion, who happened to be contracted with Yamaha at the time, and his father Don Jones, who was an accomplished racer himself. And the purpose of this was to assess Honda's motocross bikes, which of course were four strokes. Now, the Jones family was one of the pioneers of American motocross, and they were very instrumental in turning Yamaha's DT1 enduro bike into the very first YZ motocrosser. And one of the first assessments that they had after riding Honda's prototype motocrossers was, your bikes are too big and the engines should be two strokes. Now, obviously, Mr. Honda didn't want to hear that. Still stubborn on this whole four-stroke idea, Honda shortly thereafter shows up to the Japanese motocross championships and they get completely waxed by the two strokes of Yamaha, Kawasaki, and Suzuki. So at this point, not only is Honda getting dirt kicked in their face by the European two-stroke motorcycles, now their cross-country rivals Yamaha, Suzuki, and Kawasaki are slaughtering them as well. And at this point, I believe Sachiro Honda had enough. And even though he hated two-strokes, I think he hated losing more. Now, luckily for Soichiro, while this whole thing was going on, a group of young Honda engineers just so happened to be building a secret two-stroke engine prototype. And when they finally summoned the courage to present it to Mr. Honda, I think he realizes at that moment he has no choice but to embrace two strokes. And this is where he was famously quoted as saying, if you insist on building a two-stroke, it better be the best in the world. 
And in August of 1971, the Honda development team took a two-stroke prototype to a Japanese national championship race in Mine Yamaguchi, where they tried, or at least tried to make the press feel like they were trying to be sneaky by disguising it in stealth style. But I guess it was obvious at the time that who else would be bringing a dirt bike to the Japanese Nationals since Yamaha, Kawasaki, and Suzuki are already here with their bikes, only Honda's missing, so it must be a Honda. Anyway, the results from that race were good enough that Soichiro Honda gave his reluctant blessing to produce not only a works competitive motocross racer, but also an out-of-the-box version as well. With the two-stroke prototype now complete, Honda goes back to the Joneses, and this time the Joneses are singing a different tune. They're impressed enough with the motorcycle, they agree to help Honda finish refining it and build that motocross machine Honda once. Now, while all of this is going on, Honda decides to add a little extra Americanness to this bike by naming it the Elsinore after the popular Elsinore GP, which is held in the United States that was featured in the iconic film on any Sunday. And through trial and error, they come up with a final version. And in 1973, Honda releases the CR250M Elsinore. It was a single cylinder two stroke with a dry weight of 214 pounds that produced close to 30 horsepower. Now, those were pretty respectable numbers back in the 70s. Now, when the bike is released, Gary Jones agrees to race it in the 1973 AMA Nationals, and immediately he starts winning races on it, and ultimately he would become the champion that season. So right off the bat, the Honda Elsinore is a winning machine. It should be noted that Gary Jones deserves a majority of the credit for the early successes of the Elsinore, because at the time, he was probably the best rider in the United States. And he did win the first three AMA national titles with three different machines. But nonetheless, this is an extraordinary lesson in greatness. Soichiro Honda swallowed his pride for the sake of winning. Then he went out and found the best rider in the world to give him constructive criticism about his machine. And whether he liked it or not, he took that information and was able to build a once in a generation iconic machine. Honda was able to go from zero presence in motocross racing to having a championship in under two years, and that's remarkable. But that's only the beginning of the story when it comes to the Elsinore. While the 250 was the first model to be released, it would be the 125cc version that would take over the world. Released in 1974 for the new 125cc class, the 125 Elsinore was the bike the public wanted. And in the hands of rising star and your prototypical bad boy blonde haired Californian Marty Smith, the Honda was an unstoppable works machine. Back in the 1970s, small bore two-strokes between 100 and 125 cc's were wildly popular. And one of those reasons that they were far cheaper and less intimidating machines. And since motocross is mainly a teenager to a young 20-something sport, they flocked to the 125 Elsinore. However, the Honda Elsinore didn't revolutionize the world and become the iconic machine that it's known for today just because of some race wins by some legendary riders. I mean, Yamaha and Suzuki were winning races back then too. In fact, the Honda Elsinore wasn't the fastest or the lightest dirt bike that you could buy at the time. So how in the hell did it become so iconic? Because the Honda Elsinore was graded on the sum of its parts. What is often overlooked in stories when it comes to Soichiro Honda is what a cunning, top-level, savage businessman that he was. Much like Honda did with the Super Cub in the 50s and 60s, which is the greatest selling bike of all time, they flooded the market with affordable, durable, carefree, capable machinery. In the 1960s and early 70s, there wasn't very many purpose-built dirt bikes to choose from. Most off-roaders just bought a street bike and threw some dirt tires on it. Because back then, the only out-of-the-box race-ready machines were the Husqvarna, CZs, Makos, and the like. And of course, the problem with those motorcycles is they were unreliable, difficult to get replacement parts for, and dealerships were sparse. And this is where Honda capitalized. 
First, the Elsinore was race bike ready out of the box. No need to take a hacksaw or welder to it. It was ready to go as is. The second is the Elsinore was produced in mass quantities. No need to drive hundreds of miles to a dealership or wait several months to get your European motorcycle shipped to you. Just walk down to your local Honda dealer and there's one available right now. The third is most replacement parts for the Elsinore were in stock at those dealerships. So if you had any kind of accident or something broke, it was easy to fix it. And last, which is probably the most important thing, the Honda just didn't break down. And this is what Hondas are known for to this day. They may not be the lightest or the fastest in their category, but they simply do not break down. There are no Honda horror stories or forums discussing problems with Hondas. And Soichiro always knew there was a premium to be paid with convenience and peace of mind. Combine all that with the fact that back in the day, they were selling Honda Elsinore 125s for around 700 United States dollars, which which is roughly 4,970 today, when the average European 125cc motocrosser was going for about 1,000 United States dollars, which is around 6,240 bucks today. I mean, what's not to like here? You now have a motorcycle that matches the Europeans on performance that's far more reliable, has 10,000 times the extensive dealer network, and on average it costs 300 bucks less. I mean, why would you even buy the European bike? And of course, people didn't. And when you add all of this sum up together, it instantly puts the screws to companies like Bultaco, CZ, Husqvarna, and Maiko. They simply could not match the firepower of Honda, and they would soon go extinct. Now, Yamaha, Kawasaki, and Suzuki could keep pace with dealer networks and produce bikes in mass quantities, but outside of the KX line, which was relatively reliable, back in those days, I know the younger generation will find this hard to believe, but Yamaha YZ motocrossers and definitely the Suzuki RMs were not that dependable. And that's where Honda won out. And that was always what was so important to Suichiro Honda. He would rather have his bikes be a few kilos heavier and slower than the competition than be unreliable and break down all the time. And for everyone who is listening to this video, if you ever bought a Honda, reliability was probably a determining factor because again, peace of mind sells. For Honda, they would add red accents to the Elsinore in 1975, and in 1976, the Elsinore would become all red, giving birth to that ride red identity that we know from Honda today. And they would continue production of the Elsinore until 1982, when the name would be dropped in favor of what we see today, which is the CRR models. But as we look back on the sport of American motocross, without question, the Honda Elsinore changed everything. It was the right motorcycle that was built at the right moment in time. Its affordability and reliability opened the door to a more affordable way to race, which only helped the sport grow faster. And as each European manufacturer fell one by one like a house of cards, Honda, Yamaha, Kawasaki, and Suzuki would all take turns ruling the American motocross landscape in a Japanese manufacturing version of Game of Thrones that lasted for longer than three decades. Because it wouldn't be until the year of 2000 when Kelly Smith won a Mudfest motocross race at High Point on a KTM did a European manufacturer have any success in American motocross racing some 28 years after the introduction of the Elsinore and with KTM and its sister brands Gas Gas and Husqvarna which only emerged recently the Orange Brigade has been Europe's only presence in US motocross racing and no other other genre of motorcycling did any motorcycle put the screws to other manufacturers up the level of competition and change the sport in a way like the Honda Elsinore did. And I guess in some sort of paradox or self-contradictory statement, when it came to the Elsinore, nothing became more American than a Japanese motorcycle. If you turn on the TV or cruise through the internet today, it won't take you long to find some scientists debating about when the next mass extinction event will take place and what the cause of it will be. And while much of this is just senseless jargon, if history repeats itself, which most likely it will at some point in time, a mass extinction event will take place because nothing in this world lasts forever. 
But the thing about mass extinctions is they are brutal, fast, and unfortunately unstoppable. And like it or not, whenever Mother Nature speaks, the world has no choice but to listen. However, regardless of how devastating the extinction is, somehow life always finds a way. Some species always survives and emerges stronger than ever before, and it is their turn to exude their rule on the world and change the way things are done. So when it comes to motocross, the question is, will there ever be another bike like the Honda Elsinore? Something that will change the game forever and reinvent the sport in the way that we ride regardless of whether we like it or not? Well, of course the answer is yes, it's just a matter of time. And as many scientists believe the sixth mass extinction has already begun, we just don't see it yet. Perhaps the next moto mass extinction has already begun as well. We just don't see that either.